sorry I'm a little late. I had a bit of problem getting my slides working, so I'm just going to be scrolling through them. Uh, so my name is Gabriel. Uh, I work at Dot .cloud. Um, uh, so we're a platform that takes the pain out of web app deployment. If you want to know more about, about Dot .cloud, I'm not going to really talk about it very much today, but come talk to me after. Uh, we're also hiring, so you can talk to me about that too. Okay, on to business. How many people here know Django? Okay, so the majority of you. Um, and most of you who know Django probably started out with the Polls tutorial. Um, do you guys all know the Polls tutorial? Does that ring a bell? Yeah? Basically, it's a really simple application. It's the very first tutorial for Django. Um, you create polls, you create answers to the polls, um, and it's great, except what if you want to refresh the page for each vote? Uh, or sorry, if you don't want to refresh the page for each vote. So the Django docs don't really give us an answer to that. Um, the closest they do is they, they hint somewhere in the view docs uh, about uh, returning a view from JSON. Um, what you end up with when you try to do this with jQuery and just returning random JSON from blobs, uh, or from, from random views in Django is uh, something like this. Um, we had the same question when we were building out our dashboard. Uh, our site's built on Django, but we, uh, you know, we have a lot of views that um, are actually checking the state of physical web servers that, we're running, that are running our customer's code, uh, rather than querying the Django database. So for us, um, you know, being asynchronous is, is a must. Um, so our answer was, like I said, jQuery spaghetti. Um, a huge, messy pile of it. Uh, and as we added more one-off Django views, we realized that it was just getting completely incomprehensible. Okay, so here's what Django looks like. Uh, we have, basically, Django is uh, talking to the database, spitting out HTML, which goes to the user. Um, but this is really Django, this is actually sort of hiding the full picture. Um, really Django, right, there's the, there's the uh, Django model layer, which is the database, the Django view layer, um, and which uses Django templates to actually spit out that HTML. Um, the problem really comes when you start doing this. When you have this um, jQuery and, and JSON running down the side, um, it creates pain. So, Ember is a better way to do this. Uh, Ember basically cuts out the ugly part of that application. So instead of using Django's template rendering, um, everything just goes from a Django view directly into, uh, into JSON, serialized, sent to Ember over the wire as data, uh, and then all of the HTML rendering happens on the client side. Okay, so what we're gonna do uh, in the short time that remains is we're going to refactor the polls app as a um, uh, as an Ember app. So let's take a really quick look at the finished product, if I can find it. <laughs> let's just do, 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 oh, where are you, mouse? Okay, so here, I'll just do this, I'll just use this view. Here is our awesome polls app. So you can see that we, right now our home page, we do polls, uh, we have page one, page two, another. So in polls, 
Okay. So, let's go build this. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is expose uh, so this is yeah so this is the Django the model of the of the whole uh, like I mentioned before we have a whole model of the collection we have a choice uh, that is uh, has a foreign key to a poll, uh, the actual choice field, and the number of votes. Um, so what we're going to do is expose this as an API using big blank space. Uh, sorry, and it's going to look a little something like this. Uh, so this is how we're going to serialize our questions, and this is how we're going to serialize our polls. Sorry, other way around. Um, and to do that, we're going to use Django REST Framework. Uh, how many people have heard of REST Framework before? OK, it's one of several ways to expose things over a REST API from Django, and it's pretty awesome as far as I'm concerned. It uses the new class-based views. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is create our resources. Uh, and sorry, I'm going to have to really fly through this because we are really short on time. Um, but it's fairly straightforward. Um, there's only a few little tricky parts. But basically, we're just creating a model resource. Um, so it essentially, much like a model form in Django, it just exposes our field essentially for us. Um, there are a few tweaks we need to make in order to get the exact format that we want. Um, particularly, we're going to have to um, yeah, exclude some fields and include some other fields because we want to pass IDs, uh, which aren't passed by default. Um, I'm going to put this code on line afterwards uh, so you, you can check it out there. Don't try to like type it out or anything while I'm talking. Uh, next, we're going to create our views, uh, which are essentially referencing. Um, it's really just boilerplate. It's just referencing these resources that we created previously. Now we're going to create our URLs, which again are just referencing these views. Um, and as you can see, passing along the, passing along the primary keys. And we're going to add that to the root URLs um, along with this Django REST framework stuff that is, again, just boilerplate. Whoa, we have a big red thing. Hello. said, had some problems getting this exported <laughs> properly. OK, so let's uh, go quickly play with this API. Um, so we can do that via curl, but luckily for us, Django REST Framework also exposes itself um, HTML endpoints so that we can just do it in the browser. So much like the Django admin, um, I don't know how much of that you guys can see, but basically Django REST Framework just uh, builds out, you can essentially see the different format types that it can return here. Um, and one of them is HTML. Uh, so it'll, it'll actually give you the uh, sort of the raw um, API, uh, or sorry, what would be returned by your API as, um, but with, you know, nicely formified. Okay. 
Okay, so our API, although we didn't really go through it because we don't have too much time, um, looks pretty good. Let's move on to the Ember part. So, what is Ember? Um, Ember, there's sort of three main parts to Ember. Uh, the first is the standard library. Um, so Ember includes what they call a standard library, um, but it's, it's really mostly lower level than what we call a standard library in Python. Um, it's mostly things that we get from the object system uh, and from built-ins. So um, it's mostly, like I said, it's things that we sort of as, as Python developers really take for granted. Um, you know, things like iteration, map and filter, um, and properties are, are just language features for us, but in JavaScript they're sorely lacking. Um, so it's really more like when, when they say standard library, it's really more like C standard library, like it's stuff that it's really difficult. You know, you'd end up implementing it again yourself um, if, you, if you didn't have it to write large complex applications. Um, so I kind of think of it as if, if Python standard library is batteries included, then Ember standard, standard library is kind of the screws that were missing in the original toy that hold it together. Um, the central part of all of that is the uh, Ember object system. Um, and it's a lot like, it, it's an object system that's built on top of the JavaScript obje object system, um, and it, it adds a lot of features that makes it very Pythonic in a lot of ways, um, with a few extra features to sort of help handle JavaScript asynchron asynchronosity. Um, so personally, I'm a big fan of powerful tools that solve problems completely. Um, some people complain that Django is too big and tries to do too much. Um, as you can probably tell from my description of the standard library, uh, Ember is like way bigger than Django ever will be. Um, so if you really don't like big frameworks, maybe this isn't the one for you. Uh, you might wanna check out Backbone or something a little more minimalistic. Um, but if, like me, you wanna think about building these abstractions at a separate time from when you're implementing applications that need to use these abstractions, um, then I think Ember is probably a good fit because uh, it eliminates a lot of your busy work. So. Okay. So, one, uh, another interesting feature that was on that list um, is Ember's binding system. Um, so Ember has these things called bindings that are sort of uh, similar to Python properties um, with the additional awesomeness of having a dependency graph on top of that. Um, so what that, what that means is that um, when an ancestor property changes, if you have another property that's dependent upon it, those properties will, like the changes in properties will propagate down. Um, there's also sanity checks by default to make sure that propagation doesn't happen repeatedly for, you know, if you're, say, changing the first name and the last name and you have a computed property that is the full name, um, you only want that computed property to change once, even if you change the first name and last name separately. Um, so Ember does that by default. Um, so it, part of what makes it neat is that because it's baked into the Ember, Ember object system, um, it's, uh, it works for data, as you'd expect, but it also, it's especially cool uh, to have this built into the templating um, so that your templates are automatically updating in response to your data as well. Um, the last rather large component of Ember uh, is the MVC and app structure. Uh, and so this is what we, this is more of the type of stuff that we get from Django or when we think of web frameworks. Um, and that's what most of the rest of what we're talking about is. Okay, let's build out the client side of this application. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna need to do is install Ember. Um, now I have here just a little diagram of how I like to lay out my uh, static files. Um, and you'll notice that I have my Somewhere, I have a lib that is separate from um, my JS. Um, and that's just because I find that when you're building sort of larger JavaScript applications, you end up with so many files that it's really nice to keep your sort of external dependencies like your Ember and handlebars and all of that separate from uh, your own JavaScript files.
Oh, all I have here is uh, basically our um, just the dependencies that are needed for Ember, including Ember itself. Um, and you can see that I'm creating this application object. Um, this application object is, it's, this is gonna be our, the one object that we put into the global namespace. Uh, sorry, it is a class, not an object. Um, no, I'm lying. <laughs> um, and so basically, uh, we're creating it here, essentially it's a namespace to hang everything else off of. Um, and so then we're gonna, so everything above the creation of that um, is, Everything up here. These are all the dependencies, and then we create the uh, the application object. Then everything down here is going to be our files. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see that we have this app .initialize. So that runs after we've attached everything on to the app. Um, so Ember does what's called dependency injection uh, by default. So what that essentially means is that you almost never define instances or create instances of classes. You for most top level objects, um, you'll create the class, attach it to the application and the application will grab that class and actually instantiate it for you. Um, this is one of those magic things that some people love and some people hate. Um, personally, I find it really useful, but I can certainly understand why others might dislike it a little bit. Um, there are also some weird things in Ember about the, again, kind of useful, um, but certainly a little bit magical. They use uh, naming conventions for, for a lot of things. So if you have an app template and an, or an application template, an application controller, an application view, um, it will wire all of those together for you. Uh, okay, so all I'm doing here is just putting the uh, putting the template into the um, list of or into the list of URLs, um, so it gets rendered out. Okay, so the first piece that we're putting in, um, you probably maybe saw it. It was the one thing that we'd included after the application object um, is, so we're gonna define our, our data, uh, our data layer. Um, so I'll, in much the same way as Django, uh, Ember stores its data in models, um, although the number of fields that they offer are much fewer. Uh, so uh, what you can see here is that I'm creating a store. Um, can you guys actually see the code or is it way too small? It's fine, okay. Um, so this, uh, this store is what allows, you know, instead of in Django, right, we communicate with a database. Um, in Ember, we communicate with some backend service. Um, and basically the store is what does the translation between the formats that Ember expects and the formats that our server provides. Um, so there are a few options here that I'm instantiating, uh, but basically I'm just using Django's, or uh, sorry, Ember's built-in REST adapter, although actually I have some custom patches on it to make it work with it's really built in a Rails-centric way um, and makes some strange assumptions about what REST APIs look like that they usually don't. Um, so again, that uh, will be on, you can find that on my GitHub. Um, hopefully though, they will be merging that back in soon enough that we can um, just use the default built-in one. Um, and then I'm also defining two models uh, that are essentially just reflections of the two uh, Django models that we had, that we saw before. Um, Okay, I'm actually gonna skip this. I was gonna just click through the application again, but as you guys hopefully remember, there are essentially two states. So when we first enter the application, um, we enter through the root, uh, and then we get put into this polls state where we're looking at the list of polls, uh, and then we can click on a poll and go into an individual poll. Um, but the point is that the way that Ember uh, models application state is as this sort of hierarchical state graph. So like I said, sorry, we come in through the top level. Um, the way Ember templates work is a direct reflection of that. So at this top level root, um, we have our application template, which is this outer box. Um, and then Ember defines what are called outlets, which are essentially little holes that you can plug sub templates into. Um, so as we go down into the polls, we get automatically redirected into the polls view, the multiple polls. Um, this out outlet gets filled in with the polls template. Um, then when we click over on a specific poll, we'll jump back up to the root, so it will be emptied, that outlet will be emptied, um, and then replaced with the poll view. So, let's look at how that actually plays out. 
Um, the application template is, as you can see, quite simple. We just define a top-level block and then this outlet tag. Um, you can see that these actually look quite a bit like Django templates. This is using uh, the default template library is uh, Handlebars, uh, which is also by Yehuda Katz, the author of, of Ember. Um, this is our polls template. Um, so again, fairly straightforward. Uh, basically, we're just iterating over each of the polls in the controller um, and then outputting the length of the choices or sorry, um, to say how many options there are. And somewhere, um, you can see it right here, uh, we have this action, this show poll action. Um, so that's what's going to actually cause us to go sort of back up through that router and then back down to the specific poll. So you can see we're passing in the poll as context there. Oh, apparently I'm drawing. Oh, God. <laughs> Why you shouldn't run slides in your editor. Um, here's the specific poll view. Uh, so in a mu very similar way, we're iterating over the choices. Um, and here we have two other actions. These ones, instead of targeting, so by default, the, you saw that previous action, we didn't have to specify a target. Um, that's because by default, it targets the router. Uh, in this case, though, we want to target the controller, um, which you will see momentarily. Uh, and basically, this is just doing the vote up and the vote down actions. Um, so how do these templates actually get put together? Um, you can actually embed these templates directly into your top-level HTML uh, file. But if you're going to do that from Django, like I said, these templates actually look very similar to Django templates, so they will be parsed to Django templates, which causes a bit of difficulty. So you can use um, a template tag that will essentially take verbatim what you put within it and insert it into your template. Um, but it's kind of a big hassle, and having all of your templates in one file is really not a very good idea. I think that's a bit of a code smell. Um, so you're really better off using the precompiler, uh, which you can find on my GitHub there, or you can just install, if you already have Node installed, it uses Node because it's written in JavaScript, um, you can just uh, install it like so. Um, a little plug for another little app I work on, or built, uh, uh, Python Pro is basically just a, it's a way to, it's a generic file watcher and will rerun tasks when files change. Um, so it's useful to use that to update your uh, rendered or your compiled templates. Uh, okay, let's look really quickly at the views and controllers. Oh, mm, mm. or not, because I don't have the code there. Um, and so we'll skip to the Ember router, which is really the most interesting and important part. Um, so, like I said, it's basically just a direct representation in code of this state graph. Um, now, it actually is very explicit about being a state graph. I don't just mean that it like it is, you know, sort of encapsulates state proper or state somehow. Um, like it actually, you write it as a state machine, um, which has really three big benefits. One is that it prevents impossible states. Um, two is that it allows you to log what states you're in. You can turn on logging, and it can give you the full trace of a user through your application. Um, and finally, it lets you debug live apps if you so choose, um, which actually is something that. Um, Apple used um, on, when, on their iCloud project. They had a really uh, subtle bug that was only affecting a small portion of their users, which of course was you know, tens of thousands of people. Um, and so they turned on, route, or turned on debugging for everyone, and when there was an error, they would push that back up to the server. Um, and so what that allowed their QA team to do is actually get back into the exact same state, follow the entire path through as their users had uh, in order to reproduce the bug. Um, so there are a few things that are missing that we haven't covered yet. Uh, first is um, creating new polls and choices um, and the breadcrumb. Those are the two things that were, that were implemented uh, in the demo that I didn't go over. Um, and there are a couple improvements you could make um, that we really should make. Uh, one is using push date for routing. I don't know if you noticed, but we were using hash-based routing, which Twitter um, infected the world with and really is not the best way to go. Um, push state based routing allows you to have real proper URLs without that ugly hash in there. Um, and we also are not loading very efficiently right now. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed again, but there, um, right now we're just loading each object individually, which is uh, not a very good way to go. Um, so we should be bulk loading them. And we 
are all out of time, so that is the end. Thanks.